Susan, your whole life has been around these beautiful, beautiful dogs in Alaska. Uh, let's talk a little bit. We can go back to Aristotle, you know, to quote people about how important it, uh, it is for us and what we get, whether it's your dog at home and you with a dedication of a lifetime. What is it? Why do we need to keep our, our communion with animals going? She's going to cry. She cries <laughs> now when she talks about the dogs. Well, I'm going to take your question and go back to what these guys were talking about. I never answer a question straight out. I have to change it around. I, I want to go back to the, um, the risk thing, and it'll bring us right to what she's talking about, if it's okay with you. Um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> well, I just want to say, you know, certainly there had been a lot of uh, life-threatening situations that I'd gotten into for, for years. It, it was part of what I did, and I understood that really well. And then becoming a mother and now I'm pregnant again, it, it becomes, you know, much more, you certainly go through a phase of thinking this over. Um, I want to say, I know for all of us it's the same, but certainly uh, much of what I do and whether or not I get in a life-threatening situation or not has a lot to do with preparedness and education. And so I'm not going out and climbing a mountain unprepared or running the Iditarod or being living out where there's only seven people in 2,500 square miles without preparing myself for this. And I've been preparing myself, you know, when I was in Massachusetts and Maine, I was an outdoors woman. That's what I did. And uh, certainly my 25 years in Alaska, I have learned how to take care of myself and my animals out in the wilderness. And so when I go out there, there isn't a whole lot of risk that I or my dogs are going to die out there. But something can happen. But I would certainly rather die there than being hit by a car in New York City and doing nothing that I want to be doing. And I can tell you that my four-year-old daughter sees this. And we have a, uh, every once in a while we have to go into Fairbanks which is a town of about 40,000 people. And that's where we get our supplies. And we have a cabin in there so that when we stay, um, we can uh, work in there. And Tecla will look at me and she goes, Mom, you're looking sad. And I go, no, I'm not sad. I'm concentrating. <laughs> and, and I am. I'm concentrating on something. And then, I, and then I look at her and I go, no, I'm sorry, Tecla. I probably am a little bit sad today. And when we're out in Eureka at our home, She'll just go, um, mom is always the happiest out here. And she's been seeing that since she was two years old and expressing that. And so um, I don't think that there's anybody who loves me um, in my family who doesn't think that it's more important that they share their life with me while I'm happy and doing what I want to be doing than if I was totally miserable living in a city somewhere and probably making their lives pretty miserable. So I think that's really important. And I did also have a time that this came to me very strongly. Um, it was before Tecla was born, but I was training in the fall of the year, so somewhere in October, November, where the creeks are mostly frozen, but not always frozen, and the rivers. And I was taking an <coughs> eight-dog team out and this is going to get to talking about the bond that I have with my dogs. And I know that it's very hard for all of you to think of 94 dogs and having incredible bonds with your dogs. But you have to remember, I live where there's almost no people. And these are my workmates. They're my playmates. They're my family. Um, I don't go to work and come back and give them a walk at the end of the day. I'm with them all day long. In the evenings while we're eating dinner, there they are. Uh, a group of them are in the cabin sitting on the couch. Um, it's just a... <laughs> constant being with the dogs and I took this eight dog team out and I'm always it drives my husband crazy because uh, he says where are you going and I go well I'm gonna go over there and invariably I get out a mile or two and go that's gonna be boring I'm gonna go over here and try something that I've never done before so that's what I did and I decided to try to go up the Hootlanana River that day and I turned up the river and shortly after uh, the dogs and myself kept falling through thin ice and um, we never fell completely through and we managed to get over to the other side and get to some, some strong ice 
but we were ruining our exit. And I couldn't turn around and go back, and I knew we'd gotten into a bad situation. And I kept thinking that if I get, went forward a little bit further, I'd get to uh, an open swamp where we could get off the river and somehow get back to home. And we came across a spruce tree that had fallen across the river, and the dogs sneaked through. But when <coughs> I got in there, the sled got stuck between some of the boughs that were coming down. So we couldn't move. And I thought, this is a good opportunity for me to go and assess our situation. <laughs> so I walked <laughs> yeah. away, from the, uh, away from the dogs and away from the sled, and poof, I dropped through. And uh, this was a, just a medium-sized river. And so I could actually touch the bottom, just, just right about at my neck. Uh, my feet could be on tippy toes. Now in Alaska, the rivers freeze from the top and bottom at the same time. So if you're touching the bottom, it's glare ice. And so I was able to get my hands or arms up on the ice, and I was kicking with my feet, trying to uh, get up. And I struggled like this for a couple minutes. And you know, the water is about 31 degrees, and, uh, or 32, I guess. But it's, uh, I was going. And I knew it. And uh, I thought, well, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm going to die. And what do I want to do with the last seconds of my life? And the dogs were sort of, at this point, over here. And I'm like this. And I thought, well, I want, I want to look at my dogs. So I turned to look at them. And, you know, idiot me, I hadn't been thinking about them or what they were feeling or what they were thinking. And of course, all 16 eyes were just glued to me and going, oh my god. Uh, and when I looked at co-pilot Ali in, the, in their eyes uh, to say goodbye, they thought of it. I didn't say a command. I didn't do anything. They swung the team, and they were close enough to get over to me where I was able to grab a hold of them, and they pulled me out. And